everybody. Thank you, distinguished panelists, for uh, joining us. We're, we're so happy that you're here. And uh, let me just make a few um, introductory comments. And then our plan is to have each of our panelists uh, briefly introduce themselves. And then we are going to get right to our discussion. Um, so before we start, you know, I can't help myself, but the 2020 census is underway and uh, we still are trying to get the 34% or so of the households in our state that have not completed the census to do so. Um, so please do um, help we need responses from the LGBTQ plus community. This is a historically undercounted community. Um, and those policies. the census. Uh, and the other thing I, I would like to point out is that today is the fourth anniversary of the very tragic Pulse nightclub shooting um, that occurred on June 12, 2016, uh, which unfortunately and tragically affected so many LGBTQ young people. We are also in the midst of a pandemic uh, which has affected LGBTQ youth in many ways, um, educational, educationally, and also in terms of um, mental and physical health and well-being. Um, so this month is Pride Month, and I know that um, many of you have been celebrating uh, along with uh, our office, but even though we are, we are celebrating and there's a lot to celebrate uh, because we've made some wonderful strides in Connecticut because of all of your efforts. Um, unfortunately, there is still a lot to do, particularly with respect to our LGBTQ young people. And so uh, we're gonna be talking today about what programs, services, resources are available to LGBTQ youth in Connecticut. And uh, we are looking forward to hearing um, from each of you about um, youth programs, check-ins, counseling, um, any kind of work that you are doing to help young people. So um, why don't we, um, start uh, with introductions and um, Representative Raheb Ali Brennan, would you please introduce yourself and then we'll go to Linda Estabrook. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Raheb Ali Brennan. I'm the state representative for the second assembly district, which includes my hometown of Bethel, part of Danbury, part of Reading, and part of Newtown. Um, Lieutenant Governor, I would also add that I actually filled out my um, sentence recently. Um, I know it's a bit late, but still, it's still in the time frame. Um, and I guess the census only will tell you if, you've, uh, if you're have if you married to a person of the same sex. So people like me and Representative Curry will not be counted as LGBTQ. So it's a step, but not one far enough, you know? Um, I just wanted to point that out. Because I, oh, I was- We're gonna have to work on that for next year. I mean, <laughs> I've had other people point that out, so, so thank you. Um, let's go to Linda Estabrook. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday afternoon. At least I um, so I'm executive director of the Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective. And uh, with me today, I also have Kim Adamski, uh, who's involved in some of our youth uh, services programming. Excellent. Patrick Dunn. 
Hey everyone, uh, my name is Patrick Dunn. Uh, I am the Executive Director of the New Haven Pride Center in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, also with me, and I'll let her introduce herself, is um, Allah, who runs our youth programming. Uh, and just to echo um, the representative, I do also want to say that the census also does not do a good job of recognizing trans and non-binary identities. And those questions were also deliberately taken out to hide our community. It's too bad we have to wait 10 years to fix all this. So frustrating, but um, you know what? We should actually talk to um, the Census Bureau um, sooner rather than later because there are community surveys that have questions about uh, people's identity and maybe we can start with those changes so that 10 years from now we will be uh, more equal. So uh, Allah, please say hello. Hello y'all. Um, please forgive me. I'm, I'm double dutying and I'm in Waterbury doing some mutual aid stuff. So um, thank you for having me. I am the youth program officer at New Haven Pride Center, and I'm really excited to um, be here on the call with you folks today. I would like to second and third um, the previous statements. Um, and I would really like us to maybe on a different call, park and lot it, really um, include our queer community when you folks are thinking about those revisions to the census and yes unfortunately we have to wait 10 years but i think that that means that by the next 10 years our census will be phenomenal and will set tones for the rest of the country so he so i'll commit um right now that uh Rahab and i uh will work with our federal congressional delegation uh to make some suggestions to them and uh, Allah and Patrick and any um, of the members of these panels, uh, this panel, please let us know uh, what you think we should add because it's important that everyone uh, be counted and we'll let our de delegation know and, and we can start working on that sooner rather than later. So that's fantastic. And I think Rahab has some rather direct access to our congressional delegation. Okay, um, let's see. Andrew uh, Dow. Okay, we don't have Andrew yet. Um, do we have Professor William Mann? Yes, I am here. Um, I am, I'm Will Mann. I am the um, director of the LGBT Center at Central Connecticut State University. And I'm also a professor in the history department where I teach LGBT history, history of AIDS, um, uh, LGBT fiction, LGBT film. Ah, very good. And uh, do we also have Rusty Barcelo, uh, Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion and Equity? She was here a moment ago. I, I remember seeing her. Um, all right, if she comes back, uh, we will call on her. Do we have Kamora Harrington? And finally, Kim Adamski. Do we have Kim? Okay, Kimberly's gonna have to take herself off of mute. Kimberly? I'm here, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was talking to uh, just Linda, I guess. No, um, my name is Kim Adamski, HIV prevention specialist at the Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective uh, with Linda. And I've been doing a lot of social media and working on the queer prom, um, doing some youth outreach on social media. So I am here with Linda to help out on this. Excellent, excellent. So why don't we start with uh, Patrick Dunn and uh, also Ala, because uh, we would love for you to talk about some of the youth programs and services that you have available at the New Haven Pride Center. Sure, I'll let Allah actually go first um, as it's really her bread and butter. Excellent. Allah's there multicast. Oh, yes, I am, I am. I apologize, but you know, this is how the work looks when we're doing mutual aid. Um, we actually have some really great programming 
Um, and we just completed some really great programming. So I would like to share our current programming and then also share a tone of the work that we do. It's actually the work that we've always done. Um, so currently we have Youth Safe Space, which is every Thursday at, from six to seven. And it's inclusive for all queer youth, uh, no matter where we fit into the rainbow. We also have some writing workshops that are coming up. We have more than enough volunteers, so we're gonna be able to offer more than one setting and keep them very small so that the youth voices are really exacerbated in that space. Um, we also have a zine making um, event coming up soon within the next two months. And it looks like um, due to all the work and the donations and the work that we've been doing recently with Resilience, one of the uh, fundraisers that we just had on the 6th, I believe, um, we had some people want to donate some time and do a couple more zine making uh, events, which are some of them are going to be more socially conscious around the things that are unfortunately trending right now around police violence and abolition and defunding and divestment. And so we're looking to use that space to really allow the youth voice to explain why they are calling for the things that they're calling for and why their demands are as they are, as um, the youth are the ones who develop those demands. And um, for those of you who don't know, I also double dip. I'm the co-creator of the New Haven chapter of Black Lives Matter New Haven. And so we support those demands fully and we have a really inclusive, amazing plan as to how we are going to create new systems in New Haven and hopefully that can matriculate to our other cities and the state of Connecticut. Um, but back into our Pride Center programming, uh, we just finished this amazing writer, creative writing workshop called Queered Words. And we partnered with uh, Arts and Ideas and a small writing uh, collective named The Word, which is led by youth. Um, some of you folks may be very familiar with that work. Um, I want to also um, acknowledge the past work that we just were able to do, especially right before COVID hit, because it did shift a lot of the work that we're doing and, and we're doing more mutual aid stuff. Like, uh, well, I will mention we have a food pantry, which is amazing. And that's not just a youth effort. That is an effort with all programming through the Pride Center. But we are able to staff and employ temporarily younger persons to help organize that and, and do all the distribution and take up the lead in that work, which is really amazing. We also have a clothing um, donation center, which we had to put on hold a little bit due to COVID, but we had that pre-existing long-standing um, before the pandemic and epidemic hit. Um, so um, we have so much program, I wanna make sure that I acknowledge it all. Um, so we had a queer youth safe space and, and um, coalition with the New Haven Library Stetson Library, which was a really good place. We had some really good ideas come to us from the youth. Um, we also, my baby, um, the queer camp, which um, is in our third year, um, is a program that we partner with, with Citywide Youth Coalition and Planned Parenthood and of course New Haven Pride Center um, and in our integral year we were able to house it at the center and due to all the work that the other programs are doing we now um, house it at the center and both the Pride Center at, um, excuse me at Citywide Youth Coalition office and the Pride Center. Due to COVID we were actually able to still keep that camp going during the summer and we, instead of the two weeks that it normally was, we are able to offer it the whole month of June. So we are holding the space of COVID allowing us to really tap into our youth programming um, even more and more effectively. And we find that our programming is growing. I encourage all you folks to also um, look at our YouTube page as we have some great panels that talk about COVID and how that work has been um, shifting our work. And we highlight the voices of organizers all throughout the state of Connecticut. Many of you, I'm sure that you have heard our voices. Some of us 
um, you know, we've challenged you on some of these things, but we're looking at the Pride Center to create that grassroots work in between the actions and the big things that you folks see to really create a communal network to really work together to create some of these solutions that we all know we need, but some of us are really still trying to figure out and educate ourselves around how we can get those solutions. And so I really encourage you folks to please look at some of our panels. We have youth intersectional um, panels. We have black queer feminism panel. We have all Spanish speaking panels. We have some Latinx organizing panels. We have women panels. So for every facet of queerness, for those of you folks who do not have the lived experience of being queer, or do not get to be so lucky as to love someone very close to you who is queer, these are great, great ways to enter into understanding the language and the work that we need. Um, and this is really a call in during COVID to really be in space and community. So I really encourage you folks that have social media um, to look at our Facebook pages. Those of you who are looking to donate to certain things, I really suggest that you folks donate to our food pantry and donate to our uh, Pride Center on a whole as we work in the community and employ so many people and folks from the community and not just in our city of New Haven, but all throughout the state. And I'm sorry for taking up so much space. No, 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 you, you, um, <laughs> uh, you are fabulous. And let me just say that I'm so happy that you brought up uh, Black Lives Matter because we are in the midst of three different crises. We're in the midst of a public health emergency. We are in the midst of an economic catastrophe. Um, you talked about the food pantry, so many people around our state are food insecure, and of course, um, we are in a racial justice crisis, and um, the, governor, the governor and I um, are in solidarity with the Black Lives uh, Matter uh, movement, and we've been so impressed with uh, the number of young people who have come forward to uh, voice their opinion and um, opposition to uh, policing policies that, that they see. And um, we uh, are uh, very impressed with, with that energy and that enthusiasm. And we hope that um, they take that to uh, the polling places in August and November because um, we're gonna need their voices to make those changes. So. Patrick, do you want to follow up? Um, Allah just gave us um, a huge <laughs> program. <laughs> and I, I, did, I, 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 want, I, I do want to give Allah a shout out because she's not going to say this about herself, but Allah is also um, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter New Haven. Um, Black Lives New Haven um, was founded uh, predominantly by Black women who are also queer women. And I think that's a really important intersectional component of how Connecticut's landscape is intersectional and our queer community is extremely intersectional. And so when we talk about the racial justice issues that um, are kind of at the forefront right now, they affect LGBTQ people just as much as they affect straight people. And it's super important to remember that. Um, uh, you know, I think when I think of some of the things that maybe Allah didn't mention that we do, um, uh, one of the things is we are a house of scholarship funds for LGBTQ youth uh, interested in either going to school or returning to school. Uh, it was really important to us that the returning piece was part of our um, our way our scholarship valuation worked. Uh, this year, we're gonna be giving out over $7,000 worth of scholarships um, uh, across a, a bunch of different um, uh, groups, including uh, a brand new scholarship geared towards um, uh, helping transgender students go to college. Uh, and we did this in direct response to the very um, disgusting show of tra transphobia that is happening within athletics um, and targeting our state specifically. Um, we also are doing a lot of 
uh, an incredible work with um, partners both here and not here today uh, around the state to, to try to make sure that we're elevating the voices of youth and supporting youth. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's unfortunate that, for example, True Colors was not able to join us today. Um, Ahmed out in uh, Waterbury working with uh, Life in My Days. Uh, folks like Citywide Youth Coalition, the Stanford and New London Youth Programs. These are, you know, there are programs actually all, quite all over our state. Um, and kind of as COVID has um, allowed many of us to work together in new and exciting ways, I think the same is true for, for uh, youth programming. Uh, one of the things that I'm super excited about, and um, I don't want to take it away from Linda because I, it's, it, Linda was the, one of the top uh, forces behind us doing this, but one of the ways that we're collaborating is across all of this, and I'll let Linda actually talk about what I mean, but um, we, we, you know, one of the most incredible things that we did was within three, maybe four weeks of COVID launching, um, a bunch of us nonprofits got together, um, the Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective, True Colors, OutCT, uh, and designed a needs assessment survey uh, that was sent around the entire state. Uh, we got back incredible data, um, very scary data, um, particularly around food and housing insecurity, mental health resources. Um, and uh, these uh, issues obviously trickle down to, um, to youth very significantly, particularly youth who may be between the ages of 18 and 25. Um, if you know when we talk about the the international definition of youth, uh, I also just want to put it out that the center also works extensively with the Y two Y network, um, which is launching Y two Y New Haven, uh, which is a homeless shelter geared towards eighteen to twenty five year old youth who have been abandoned by systems uh, that are in place uh, either in our state or in other states. Connecticut is a state that um, has a a higher percentage of LGBTQ youth that are experiencing homelessness than the national average. And that's a shame and something that we need to change. Um, so we're really proud uh, to be working with folks that do direct work in those communities like Youth Continuum and Y2Y. Uh, and uh, fortunately for us at the Pride Center, Allah also comes with that background as well. So we're, <laughs> we, get, we got a lot at Allah. <laughs> um, that's, that's Patrick, that's great. Um, you mentioned the federal uh, transgender policy coming out of the United States uh, Department of Education. And I just want to say that the governor and I oppose this policy of essentially trying to punish states. Um, you know, uh, it's good to hear that because the governor was quoted to say today saying that he'd rather have the federal funding than protect trans students. So well, um, we, are, we are we are looking at how this policy impacts high school students and um, we want to make sure that we're protecting our young people, especially because the suicide rate is so high amongst trans athletes. So we are, we are looking at that, um, at that human side. Um, and um, Patrick, you mentioned uh, Linda. And Linda, we are in this public health crisis and pandemic. Can you talk about Please, because I think Patrick gave you a really nice segue into yes. what you're doing <laughs> as a collective. So it has been interesting um, try, discontinuing most services, but yet trying to be available to people during for emergency situations, whether it's through our dental services, through our STD clinic, um, just being available to the community. We've really stepped up our, our social media presence and communications and, and Kim has done a bang up job. She, she can talk to you more about that in terms of getting messages out that, that target younger people uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, having some fun with it um, and certainly COVID related stuff, but other um, health issues. Um, Patrick had mentioned about the, the survey and that, that he spearheaded that and made that, that happen um, and brought, brought the, the rest of us into that. And what was really good about that is one, the questions were, were asked and the information um, um, was received from the community. And then I was able to take some of that information from that Patrick gave in terms of the, the results. And I'm on the public health work group of the Hartford Recovery 
um, group in the city of Hartford to, you know, get back, you know, moving with, um, you know, as we're living with COVID and we're going to continue to live with COVID for a really long time. There isn't an after COVID for a year, two years or whatever. This is like living with it. But I was able to take that information, bring that to our work group so that we had some additional data that was, it was statewide data, but also um, there was some specific Hartford data. And so that's being put to good use um, in, in the city of Hartford. Also, one of the things that, that happened is for many years, 26 years, it would be 26 years this year, the Health Collective has had an annual queer prom. And we had planned to do that queer prom in person um, this, this month, and that obviously could not happen. But then what happened is that a number of groups around the, the state, and, you know, including you know, True Colors and uh, New Haven Pride Center and whatever, we're collaborating and we are having a virtual queer prom and it's on Thursday, June 25th. And there's going to be a DJ and dancing and fun and all of that, that good stuff. Kim's been sending out um, fun packets to, 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 to folks that are going to be attending. And so it was, this became this collaborative effort to, to still do something for, for the youth. And so that's, um, I, I'm very excited, you know, that we were able to come together for that. Um, I also, knowing that, that um, actually right now, Robin and True Colors are doing their weekly, what they're calling Minicon, because their conference got, can't, got postponed from March until May, and then, yeah, that's not happening, and like, They've oops, and next Friday, there are left in June. They that are happening, and uh, the youth workshop more about day for sex, and uh, and colors, and obviously. An excellent for um, youth and their will just need to. So I just I told Robin I was going to do a shout out for True Colors today, um, and so we're working at the Health Collective trying to to putting things in place so that we can see people uh, virtually in terms of service provision, redirecting people as need be, figuring out the in-person service delivery. Um, so, and it's an adventure. Wonderful. Thank you, Linda, for that. Um, Kim uh, Domsky, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about what you're doing? Um, yeah, sure. I'm glad the virtual prom is still happening because I know everybody yeah, looks forward so, to prom. I mean, obviously, uh, queer kids sometimes feel uncomfortable at their prom um, because of, you know, heteronormativity, stuff like that. But now everybody's missing their prom. So there's that on top of, on top of that. So um, since we can't do the usual in-person prom, um, we decided to move it virtually because even though it's not quite the same, it's still a social experience. They still get to interact. Um, we've got a ton of social media stuff. I've been doing weekly giveaways. So, um, you know, just like little gift bags with like promotional stuff, fun stuff. Um, we've, I actually started a TikTok because I guess, I guess that's what the youths are doing now. Y even I'm too old for that. How is that even possible? But, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's been doing pretty well. We just hit 50 followers today and I've had it for about a month. And we just post fun videos and people, you know, like them and comment on them and they're educational in nature. Um, and we, I mean, we've got a Twitter page, we've got a Facebook page, um, and we've gotten pretty good um, interaction there. So I'm really hoping that we'll be able to make prom as interactive as possible with our hashtag BUQueerProm2020 so that people can follow what each other are doing, look at each other's outfits, chat about it. Um, so that's more or less what's going on with that. Uh, we'll have a drag performers, DJ, dancing, stuff like that, so. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. So what we're going to do is we are going to go to Professor Mann, and then after Professor Mann, um, we're going to go to State Representative Reheb Ali Brennan. And the reason that we're kind of putting him at sort of toward the end of the panel is in case there are any uh, wonderful policy ideas that you need to put into law, he would be the guy. Um, so with that, um, Professor Mann, can you talk about uh, what you've been doing at CCSU? Obviously, uh, this has been an interesting uh, semester, uh, graduation, all of that. Um, and tell me, um, you know, what your interactions with students have been like and what it's going to look like in the fall, because this is all evolving as we speak. I wish I could tell you exactly what it's going to look like in the fall. We're still trying to figure all of that out. But I can tell you that this has been an extremely stressful period for all students. Um, for LGBTQ students, it's been particularly uh, stressful in a different way, in a very specific way. Um, so many of these students have gone, homes, gone back to homes where they're not respected, where they are emotionally abused, where they are misgendered. Um, you, I can think of at least two or three students off the top of my head who on our campus found an affirmation for who they were, who they are, and when, they, when they've gone home, they've, 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 they've lost that sense of, of affirmation, of personal affirmation. Um, it's affecting their grades. It's, I, I am really concerned, as a number of national articles have pointed out, that we're going to lose a, a large number of LGBTQ college students. Um, because they're not going to come back. I, well, I, ta I talked with one yesterday who said to me that she was um, not likely going to come back to the campus if it, was, if it remained uh, remote. And we're trying now to um, talk about a high flex model where we have um, some on campus, uh, um, on ground courses, as well as some remote. Um, how that's going to look, I'm not sure. One of the things that, that our center, the LGBT center, has been doing in conjunction now that we're under the Office of Equity and Inclusion under Dr. Bar Bar Barcelo. Um, the, I am concerned that if, we, if students aren't allowed back onto campus in the fall, um, or at least, if, at least a, a limited number of them, I wanna make sure that queer students are among those being considered for those housing, regardless of their ability to pay, because they are at, at risk staying, staying where they are in many cases. So I wanna make sure that those students are are prioritized and brought back to campus um, when they need that. I mean, the LGBT Center has been doing, you know, it's traditionally done a lot of work. We've, we've been around for 11 years now. Um, we do programming, um, we do trainings, and we just had a, right before the shutdown, we did an intersectionality training. Um, we do trainings for faculties, for staff, sometimes for, for the larger community. Um, we also try to make a connection for students with the, with the larger community, and I'm, I'm, uh, I have a long history in the Hartford LGBT community, and Linda and Linda Estabrook and I go back years and years and years, probably more than we want to admit. Um, and you know, I try to connect the students with that, um, with that network that's out there, so they know there is a resource network out there. Um, we've been delivering all of these things remotely since we went online. Um, we've done trainings online, we've done workshops online, we, we created a Discord a chat room for students and it becomes their virtual hangout. Um, so it's, it's been a challenge, but um, the struggle is there. The struggle is, is there. One other thing that we've been doing, and I think that's really important, and I would love to see um, some state support around this, is that I think, um, you know, the, the events of the past few weeks have shown us the need to decolonize our curriculum. And I think that goes from, from, the, from, the, you know, from the bottom to the top, where we have to really look at what are we teaching students? Why are we not teaching them about diversity and inclusion and intersectionality? Um, why is Stonewall, for example, not taught in American history classes? I think that's crazy. Um, so we're, at, at CCSU, we are looking, we're working with the Diversity Commission to, um, to diversify this, this, our curriculum. And I, and I would love to see more schools taking that on. Great, thank you so much. Um, we see that um, Andrew Dow from Yale has, has joined us, um, and I'm gonna give him a little bit of a heads up that he's gonna go after Representative Rehab Ali Brennan. 
Um, and uh, Representative, can you talk about sort of how your constituent services have changed during COVID, what you're thinking about, um, particularly as we go into uh, a potential special session in July for uh, racial justice issues and anything else that you uh, want to add because you've been doing some, you and, and Representative Curry have been doing some great work together. Sure, well, I think I, I just first wanna thank, you know, Lieutenant Governor for highlighting this important topic and for always being a great ally and champion to the LGBT plus community. And um, I just wanna thank everyone here, the organizations, the professors, um, you know, who are on the front lines every day, making sure people in our community can access, you know, critical resources. Uh, I can only imagine how much harder COVID-19 has made your jobs. I know it's made mine hard as well. You know, we're working from home remotely, but I feel like, you know, I'm definitely working harder. Um, I just want to sincerely thank all of you. But um, Representative Curry, you know, he definitely wanted to be here today, but couldn't, and he sent his regards. And, you know, I'll follow up with him after this discussion. Um, and, you know, last year we took a major first step, you know, in making sure we could fill the service gaps for the LGBTQ plus community. And um, that was with passage of Representative Curry and I's Health and Human Services Network Bill. You know, I've, we've gotten to know many of the people on this call and, you know, we look forward to continuing that important work. And, you know, as mentioned, while we have made many great strides, uh, the LGBTQ plus community still faces many hurdles, uh, especially for our transgender brothers and sisters. And as I mentioned, as mentioned as well, you know, Connecticut's homeless youth is higher than the national average. So we have our work cut out for us in this important area as well. And, uh, you know, just the other day, I was working to connect a young transgender woman who was kicked out of her house um, you know, she needed a phone and housing, you know, which is scary, especially during a pandemic. So um, it's a good thing that, you know, I do know some of the resources here in the state, and I'm hoping that people watching today will at least, you know, um, know some of the people on this call and be able to use them as reference points. And, you know, so I'm honored to be here and listen. And, um, you know, but finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the anniversary of the Pulse tragedy. You know, it's been four years uh, since we lost 49 of our brothers and sisters at Pulse um, in Orlando. And even today, members of the LGBTQ community continue to be victims of violent crime and let's just call it what it is, you know, hate crimes. Um, for all the progress we've made, we still have far to go. And um, the conversations we're having like today will definitely lead to real action and change. And um, I want to thank the Lieutenant Governor for a meaningful discussion. Um, but, you know, with that, last year we did pass a bill as well um, to teach African American history, um, but we know we need to do more. Um, and, you know, Representative Curry and I have discussed introducing a bill to include LGBTQ history. Um, unfortunately, our session was cut short, but, you know, I'm hoping um, I have the honor of returning um, next year. And, you know, hopefully we can um, break ground on that as well. But and that's what it is. You know, it's, we have to do more. Our, our school systems need to do better. We need to talk to the Board of Eds. Why, aren't we, why are we only having 40-minute assemblies on um, Black History Month? Why aren't we talking more? People just know about Harriet Tubman. She made great strides, you know, for our country, but, you know, there's Katherine Johnson, there's so many others, and um, we're definitely willing to have that conversation. And, you know, I'm honored to be um, one of two openly gay members in the General Assembly, and especially one of color. So um, I'm happy to have those hard conversations. And I want you guys to always know that you can reach out to me. You may not, my name is spelt here, so you can write it down. But um, if you ever have events or something important is going on, whether it's New Haven and not even in my district, I'm happy to get that information out. So um, that's what we're here for, and I'll stop talking. Rahab, thank you uh, very much. That was great. And um, uh, let's go to Andrew from Yale. Um, Andrew, can you talk about some of the services um, that you provide to students and, and some of the things that you might be hearing and seeing? Sure. Um, first, thank you for having me. Um, and, uh, and thank you to everyone for sharing. I've been scribbling notes. I was an attend an attending person, but not a panelist for a while. So I heard you call my name, but had no idea what to do. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> you figured it out, though. That's good. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, a lot of the things that I had written down that I was going to share echo a lot of the things that have already been shared. Um, I think uh, I'll highlight some of the, the big uh, challenges. Um, as well as some of the, the ways that we have had to adapt um, with a, a large residential population that is now all over the world, questions of whether or not, um, when or whether everyone will be able to be on campus again um, and what that life will look like even then. Um, I think uh, during one of the periods where most of our pride and uh, 
uh, kind of shared campus celebration of LGBTQ plus identities would have taken place um, was exactly when everyone was um, told not to return or told to leave if they were able. Um, students who had serious concerns about safety or um, other concerns were able to stay on campus, but um, still in relative isolation um, and still with just the option of remote engagement. Um, so we have uh, were able to, with the, our wonderful creative student staffers, to pivot a lot of social um, kind of replications of community interactions to online platforms um, with their technological expertise um, and knowledge of the community. Um, and then uh, for at the staff level, direct our energy towards providing support to the students who um, were in particularly challenging situations um, uh, around housing, um, around uh, healthcare access, whether that's mental health care, um, also a lot of our students receive primary health care through Yale Health, um, particularly our uh, transgender um, and non-binary students. Um, so figuring out where, if and where we're able to provide support. Thankfully, we have um, an incredible staff member um, who's an LCSW who's been able to um, increase the number of hours um, of counseling that he provides, but um, we're acutely aware of the challenge of uh, that will be addressing mental health issues and concerns um, for the duration of this and in the, the aftermath. Um, so uh, I'm particularly excited to hear about the ideas that other folks have and how they're adapting to the situation as well. Um, also, the kind of also at the macro level, um, I think the issue of, of policing, violence, um, gun control. Um, again, thinking about the um, uh, the anniversary of the the Pulse massacre. Um, and how also mental health tied into that as well um, for those grieving, um, for, um, uh, for everyone involved. Um, yes, um, and a lot of students, of course, are involved in um, uh, the current social movements, Black Lives Matter, um, and in movements to um, defund the police. Um, so it's a growing campaign on campus to um, disarm or defund and or defund the um, campus police department. So engaging with that and also thinking about the interactions that uh, particularly trans and non-binary students have with police officers, um, also access to resources that um, impact those, uh, that engagement. So Connecticut introduced the non-binary um, uh, state identification option earlier in this year. Um, but many of our students are now in places that don't have um, as uh, as progressive legislatures um, that don't have the same option where um, that kind of identification isn't received with the same um, level of respect or acknowledgement. So kind of thinking through all of the different um, challenges that students are facing and how um, they can be ta tackled at the macro level as well as individual level. Thank you so much um, for raising the uh, non-binary non option on our driver's license or our um, non-motor vehicle IDs that our motor vehicle department uh, produces. Uh, we're excited about that and you should let students know because while they're here in Connecticut, they should get one if they um, you know, are from a state that is not um, so progressive. Um, Susan, Susan, do you mind if I jump in and say one thing? I just, I, I, it's in response to something that, um, uh, that the representative said, and that was, I just want to um, put out to, because I didn't say this in my section, is that a lot of our LGBTQ nonprofits, um, the ones represented here and ones not, uh, offer uh, case management services, um, including for youth and for adults. Um, the Health Collective does, um, APNH in New Haven does, um, the incredible uh, folks over at Anchor Health that specialize in transgender care offer case management for their patients. Uh, and this includes helping them with housing, helping them with food uh, and all of that. And so I just wanted to do a shout out to the fact that um, in many starts, uh, parts of our state, unfortunately not in all, but in many parts of our state, there are resources for case management. Um, and I, I, I will say that the New Haven Pride Center, we do case management for anyone regardless of where they might live in Connecticut uh, and are doing that virtually uh, 30 hours a week right now. So anybody who is experiencing any of um, the things that were mentioned as far as 
housing insecurity, homing, uh, mental health resources, uh, need for support for applying for unemployment, all of that, we, we and many of the other nonprofits around Connecticut do offer that for our, uh, the LGBTQ community. Thank you, Patrick. We um, appreciate that. And um, one of the things that we're seeing with all of this social isolation, students being at home, um, that there is a lot of uh, mental health um, issues that, that need to be addressed. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention since uh, gun violence um, was, was raised uh, by Andrew, um, you know, that is something that um, Rahab, um, many people in our, our legislature, the governor and I have been uh, working on. Um, we had three really great pieces of gun safety legislation brought forward last session. Um, and we uh, continue to, to work on that. And we, you know, we're looking forward to a point when the complexion of our Congress changes so that more can be done at the federal level. Um, so um, we're going to um, now, uh, we have about um, 14 minutes left. Um, we have a hard stop at, at three uh, because I'm going to have to run to another meeting. But uh, I want to say thank you to the press outlets that have joined us today. Um, and if they have any questions, um, if they'd like to put those in the chat function, um, we can have our panelists address those. And I want the, everyone to know that um, this is a streaming on uh, the CTN network um, and NBC Connecticut has joined us as well. And we really appreciate um, them. Um, and I uh, just wanna say uh, thank you to the New Britain uh, Pride folks for having me at their flag raising with Mayor Stewart. Um, that was, uh, a great event and we really appreciate that. Um, and let's see, we have, we have some questions here um, and here they are. And I'm gonna let any of the panelists who uh, would like to jump in on this. So question number one is, what steps should parents or guardians of transgender children uh, take over the summer to ensure that their children are safe and happy in whatever school they're going to um, next year. And they've said changing names and pronouns, figuring out gym class, locker room safety, et cetera. So we have uh, experts here. So I'll let who would ever like to jump right in to help out parents. Um, I can jump in at front, and but by no means am I the only person on this that can speak to this. No, you go ahead, and then we'll go to Andrew, who is waving his hand. So go ahead. So, um, I mean, I think as a parent, uh, one of the most important things that you can do, particularly a parent of uh, a transgender or gender diverse uh, individual, is to uh, make them part of the conversation uh, and don't make decisions for them. Um, and make sure that uh, when you, if you are proposing something that, that might be a change of like a, a gender marker or ID or whatever is that they're part of that conversation. Um, there's some incredible resources in Connecticut for transgender youth. Uh, Tony Ferriolo uh, runs a phenomenal group for trans youth and parents. Um, there is um, some awesome resources at organizations like uh, True Colors, uh, Anchor Health, um, uh, Q Plus, uh, and so I think checking out the landscape for some of those resources, uh, and um, I, I'll put my email in the, the chat, but if, if you're having trouble connecting to any of the things that I just said, I'm happy to directly connect you. But, uh, you know, the biggest thing I can say is to make, you know, have your child be part of the conversation and don't make decisions for them. I, I love that. Okay. Um, Andrew, please give us uh, your thoughts. Oh, that's a, a tough act to follow, <laughs> as usual with Patrick. Um, I, I would echo everything that Patrick has said. Uh, I think the question in itself captures a, an investment in the, the well-being of, um, of uh, uh, whoever asks children. Um, but I think parents generally just uh, uh, making incredibly clear how, how 
much they support um, their kids. Um, and uh, in addition to building community or helping them find community at school, as Patrick mentioned, um, uh, finding opportunities for them to build community outside um, and with, with and without parents, I think is really important. Excellent. Anybody else on that question? Okay, well, we have another uh, question and this is also from Danielle Fowler, who said that she recently received a copy of the September 2017 Department of Education, State of Connecticut, guidance on civil rights and protections and supports for transgender students. And she got this from her superintendent. I'm gonna have to get a copy uh, and take a look. Uh, but Danielle is saying that, um, that the policies, uh, she was unaware of, of the policies and the existence of this uh, set of guidelines. And she's asking if we could promote that. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the link for that. And Jared Todd in my office is going to make sure um, that our panelists have that because, and, and I'm going to take a, a detailed look because I think it's, it's nice to know that we have those um, resources for our students. And I think there are a lot of parents out there um, who should learn about that. Um, and I bet there are superintendents who do not know of its existence. So I'm going to work with Miguel Cardona, our education commissioner, to have him uh, make our superintendents of schools aware of those, of those guidelines. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, ask each of our uh, panelists to make a few closing remarks and we're going to try to do this in reverse order so representative Reheb ali brennan you are up well i mean i kind of summarized um some of my statement and what i just said prior but um i really just want to thank everyone for for being here today and you know it's important to highlight you know what we're all working on and that we're here um especially during this time and uh, like I said, you know, Representative Curry and I are both resources. Please use us. Please let us know when things are going on. I love this prom idea, virtual prom. Um, I'd love to just promote that. I know for many of the students in my area too, um, it's a great way for everyone to be connected. You know, we're always so compartmentalized in the small state. So um, it's important that these um, youths know that there's people there. So um, I'll leave it at that. I want to thank the Lieutenant Governor again for, for always taking the time to highlight our community. Um, it's great to have an important ally in this fight. So, and thank you everyone else for all the work you're doing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Rehab Andrew. Um, I will say uh, that one thing that has become very clear to me in the midst of this um, pandemic um, is how much better Connecticut is in so many respects um, on issues of LGBTQ um, identities and experiences um, for our students. Um, I think that it's, really going to be essential um, as our entire world has changed in the past couple of months um, that Connecticut continue to lead and really be bold and uh, do um, what seems impossible when it comes to addressing both the um, issues uh, directly um, related to LGBTQ identities, but also um, intersectional identities. Um, uh, the Black Lives Matters movement, I think Connecticut um, should push forward as much as possible in ensuring um, that uh, uh, that our policing system is radically transformed. Um, I think uh, being that, especially in that area, um, especially um, as we commemorate the lives of, uh, that were lost at Pulse, um, relatively better is never enough. Um, it needs to be, uh, we need to provide a model um, of what a state without um, the issues that we um, see so acutely in this moment. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, we, we uh, the governor and I agree. I think that the um, governor's commission on police accountability has put forward some good um, policy recommendations and our legislators, particularly um, Gary Holter Winfield, uh, the senator from New Haven, and also um, uh, Steve Stafstrom from Bridgeport are working on some really good things. Um, 
and uh, you're right, we are, we are far from perfect, um, but we are moving forward. Um, all right, uh, Linda Estabrook, any parting comments, Linda? Um, thank you, and nice to see everybody and your smiling faces. Um, Kim will make sure to get the information out to everyone uh, with, uh, about the, the queer prom so that you can share it widely. Um, and, uh, and we're going to keep up the fight every day. Excellent. Kim, parting comments? Um, oh, uh, yeah, no, Linda. Linda pretty much said it all. I will send everybody our information. You can follow us all on different social media. Uh, well, our username is HGLHC on everything except Instagram, and there it's HGLHC underscore 1982. But I'll send all you this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kim Patrick. Unmute myself. Um, I, I just want to uh, give a shout out to um, all the people who aren't here right now that do this work every single day. There's some incredible people who have done this significantly longer than I have, um, uh, you know, including, you know, the kind of the greats of, you know, the Robin McKaylins and Tony Ferriolos, but, um, you know, people who we don't uh, even think of like uh, our trans elders, uh, our folks of color who are our elders in our community um, who do this work without ever being asked to do it and just do it because it needs to be done. So I just want to give space to those people for a second in, in my final words. And, and I also just want to encourage um, the governor and, and you to um, not sell our civil liberties to the federal government um, for state funding just to protect that funding over our transgender rights. Uh, we hear you. Thank you for that. And let's see, um, Professor Mann. I think I would just say that we are obviously in a moment of high risks and high challenges, but it's also a moment of high opportunity. This is, this is the moment where if we want to make change, this is the time to do it. We, we, have, we have the momentum. We have the um, the ability to make those changes for everyone, including our LGBTQ citizens. Thank you so much. And uh, Ala, if I know Ala's multitasking, um, Ala was fantastic. And um, I'm also going to give a shout out to uh, Kimora Harrington from Kimora's Cultural Corner.com. Um, we were unable to. Um, see Kimora. Um, and I just want to say, and the same thing with Rust, uh, Dr. Rusty uh, Barcelo, um, I think there were microphone issues. So apologies for that. But Professor Mann, you did a great job. Um, and we want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. Thank you for all of the great work that you're doing. And please do keep in touch with uh, Representative Raheb Ali Brennan and me, if there's something that uh, we can do for you in state government. Happy Friday, everybody, and enjoy the rest of Pride Month. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you.